Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming and uh, welcome to the fourth uh, Space Satellite Meetup. Uh, before we proceed, I wanted to thank our gracious host, Mozilla, and uh, Brandon, co founder, who has graciously agreed to host us on very short notice. Uh, we've been told we can uh, only fit about 40 people, and that's why I had the RSVP limit at 95. <laughs> uh, so let's see how well that goes. Um, it is Tonight is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dennis Wingo, who's a, a CEO of Skycorp Incorporated. He's a, a writer, a journalist, a space historian, <laughs> currently the head of the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project, or uh, and it, which goes under his nickname Mac Moon. And if you ever visit the NASA Ames Research Center, I thoroughly recommend uh, <coughs> you visit that and say hello to Dennis. Uh, Dennis is also a space architect and a space visionary, and it, it is therefore my distinct pleasure to welcome Dennis tonight, and he will tell us uh, his vision of the economy development of the solar system. So, over to you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, and thanks, Pavel, and thanks everyone for coming tonight, and uh, I really appreciate it, and there, to me, there's an interesting significance of being here at Mozilla. Uh, there are some revolutions that begin as crescendos, and there are some that grow slowly. Um, I was around in the early days of the internet. I, uh, a little bit of my background, I've been in the computer and aerospace and academic industry for a very long time. Uh, I was, uh, one of the things I did, I was at Symbolics, which was the artificial intelligence machine, the list machine, and so we were on the internet when it was still ARPANET before passwords were on any of the computers. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun like back then doing things that would get you in a lot of trouble these days, uh, like telnetting through 15 different computers around the world. And so, uh, when Mozilla in its earliest incarnation, which we saw the very first day it came out, which was Mosaic 0.5, that was an amazing day. We saw that, and we saw that day that the world had changed. In space, it's a little different. Space and how it has developed has been kind of an artifact of the military industrial complex. Um, for those of you who read science fiction, if you've seen the science fiction of the early days, the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, uh, they talked about space mining, they talked about going and colonizing other worlds and, and, and all of these different things, but it was a, an organic growth. Uh, how many of you ever saw the movie Worlds in Collision, 1950s? When worlds collide? When worlds collide, thank you. When worlds collide. I've seen it. In, in that movie, in Worlds Collide, this is in a film in the 1950s. Uh, there was an astronomer who saw that there was a star coming into our solar system and going to wipe out the Earth, but this star had another planet around it, and we could go, possibly go to this other planet. Well, they took this planet to the U.S. government, and they took this planet to the United Nations, and everybody basically laughed at it. And it was a guy who was an entrepreneur who was afraid of dying, a rich guy who was afraid of dying, who funded the space program that saved the last vestige of humanity. It wasn't the government. But the government, and, and we talk about it, and those of you who know the post-World War II history, when the German rocket scientists came over, and Werner von Braun in the early 1950s, and this right here, this image right here, is from the early 1950s. This was Dr. Von Braun and Chesley Von Estelle's vision for space exploration circa 1952. And you had space stations and you had people building big space craft and they're going to go to the moon. And uh, Von Braun's first lunar rocket, which is very similar to this one right here, going to the moon, was going to take 18 people and they were going to stay for three months exploring building an outpost kind of like the Arctic. All of that went away with the Kennedy era uh, moon race. 
because, and, and there's uh, a recent uh, audio has been on Earth, President Kennedy really, really didn't care about space. And he was actually upset that space was taking so much money out of the budget. And, and he had a very practical example. He said, look, we're only spending $7 million a year to learn how to make fresh water out of salt water. And we're spending billions a year on space. I really don't care that much about space. I would rather spend the money on the on cancer and these other things. But we have to show our technological preeminence to beat the Russians to go to the moon. And the scientists of that era argued against going to the moon. It would be much better to show our technological preeminence by curing cancer or doing these other things. But Kenny said, no. We want to go to the moon because it's like a football game. It's a measurable goal. We know how to win. So our entire military industrial complex, everything shifted. Our culture shifted. The movie The Right Stuff, if you guys have seen the movie The Right Stuff, it was this whole heroic, we're going to the moon, we're going to do this. So all of these ideas, and President Kennedy very specifically shot down J-12, who's the NASA administrator at the time, and the ideas about space preeminence and building a moon base and, and mining and doing shot houses. We want to beat the Russians to the moon. That's what we want to do. That's why we're wrecking the budget, as we call it. So fast forward into the uh, 70s and all, we wanted the space shuttle. And I, I'm just going to... I don't really do PowerPoints a whole lot, but this right here is actually one of my favorite ones. When we in the commercial space world talk about space, usually somewhere there's there's something that's the equivalent of this. This miracle occurs, and then everything all space, you know, we want to uh, do the economic development of the solar system. Somewhere a miracle has to occur. Uh, it's one of my favorite ones. But um, uh, so NASA, what they did after the Apollo era, they wanted to expand and, and try to do things in space and there's some really cool books written back in that era about it but uh, what NASA wanted to do this right here is what it was called the flight telerobotic servicer still hasn't flown this is a concept from the early 70s NASA wanted reusable space planes that's what evolved into the space shuttle and so still it was government driven it was government demand it was you know, the government's going to do this, and this is kind of what we call the Von Braunian vision. You know, Von Braun got his start with the government, building rockets for his government uh, for nefarious purposes. But then you go forward in time, and so that government mindset, but there was another mindset that was always there. And it was the entrepreneurial mindset. The first commercial satellite that ever flew was not even a commercial satellite. It was built by ham radio guys the hackers of their day. In 1962, the first amateur radio satellite flew. It's called AMSAT, the Amateur Radio Satellite Organization. It flew as a secondary payload. So, and, and time and time after again, uh, time and time, time after time, in the world, when you take a look, it's been these guys working in their garages, and they proved that small satellites could be used for communications. And, and so they were doing this over here on the side. And at the same time, AT&T was wanting to build satellite constellations. And NASA was funding Hughes to, to do a ComSat. The government set up a global telecommunications company called ComSat to develop satellites in space. And it took 30 years to break that monopoly. And, but since that monopoly has been broken, we've actually been able to do a lot more. Today, the, sat the global geo satellite market is a $300 billion a year industry. We do have a lot of commercial space. And so this is kind of how it's evolved over the years. NASA in the 1980s did some pretty fun stuff. If you take a look here, it, and the astronauts were kind of tongue in cheek, but they, they would launch satellites out of the shuttle cargo bay and they would build these truss structures. I actually worked with some of the people who did this. And, and they did a lot of fun stuff until Challenger happened and NASA started retrenching. But fast forward, these small satellites continue to, to grow. And they've grown slowly, but they've continued to grow. Uh, 
the amateur radio satellites, we started building one, and I, I built one in the 1990s. It was an amateur radio satellite that actually carried an imaging system. It was one of the first ones that carried an imaging system. And there were other places that started out, like Surrey Satellite Technology, which came out of a university at the University of Surrey in England. And there's all of these university efforts. And so what I'm kind of talking about here is if we're going to do the economic development of the solar system, which is this god awful grandiose idea, we can't do it like the governments because, frankly, and I'm going to see this today, governments are fairly incompetent. And governments do a few things well, they do a lot of things not well. So what the kind of the focus of my talk tonight is kind of, there's an old story from the 1930s, it's called Rock Soup. In the 1930s, or the, the, the folks in the Depression, they would ride the rails, the hobos. And there's a story about a hobo. He took a metal pot, and he put a rock in it, and he poured some water over the rock. And he takes this rock up to a house, to this, and he knocks on the door, and the woman comes to the door and says, Ma'am, um, I, I don't want to bother you now. I, I don't really want much, but I have this rock soup here. If you have a little piece of celery that you could drop in here, you could maybe give us a little flavor to this. And of course, they're going to do something like this. But then he'd go to the next house. Do you have like maybe an onion? Well, by the time it was over with, he had stew. And, and so it's kind of the bootstrapping. It's the idea of bootstrapping. And so, no, we're not going to, and what I'm talking about tonight is that we're not going to have the grandiose idea, but grandiose ideas, just like the internet, start out small, but then they come to a point and there's a crescendo. The mosaic, or as they call it, the Netscape moment, happened in the early 1990s and everything has changed. But that moment would have never happened had not the price of Ethernet controllers. When I first started working with Ethernet controllers in the early 1980s, they were over $1,000 for an Ethernet controller. And then the price of an Ethernet controller dropped to 500 Then it dropped to 100 When it got under $100, was coincident to the time that Mosaic was coming out. And so as the production rates increased and as that happened, Mosaic by itself would have never made it had not the, the infrastructure that had been slowly growing over several years had now gotten to the point where it was cost effective to take advantage of this new software that came out of NCSA uh, up there in uh, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and the work at CERN, the physicists, and all that happened. So I, I love this juxtaposition and this idea. So the satellite industry has continued on. We're in the 1990s. We we're building small satellites. Some people are doing commercial small satellites. The amateur radio guys are building. But then in 2000, another little infrastructure hit. There was a gentleman by the name of Bob Twiggs. And Bob was a really good guy. He uh, started out at Weber State. He was down here at Stanford. And they came up and said, you know, these satellites are still too expensive. We've got to get the price of these satellites down. So they came up with the design of what's called the CubeSat. And the CubeSat is a one kilogram satellite. It's 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters. You know, how expensive is it? Millimeters. You're, you're right, millimeters, thank you. 100 millimeters. <clears throat> so, how expensive? And it became really easy for classes at universities to start building these CubeSats, but they have a problem. The can't get a ride right to space. It's still expensive. But a one kilogram satellite is a lot cheaper to get to space than a 10 kilogram or a 100 kilogram. My satellite was a 34 kilogram satellite. It took me nine years to get it launched. So they're, they're looking at faster opportunities, more stuff, but at the time, they didn't have the infrastructure. They were building computers and software and all, but they couldn't get rides. And so it's, it, but it continued to grow. They got a few rides. They got some of these up. They had classes. You're building people who have uh, now uh, experience what we did in our satellite project, and I'm, I'm giving the economic development of the solar system. I'm telling you, but it, it's it's a trip. <laughs> <coughs> so when you're building these satellites in the 90s and the early 2000s, what you're doing, you're building a cadre. You're building a cadre of students, and as a student designs a satellite, especially these student university projects, 
you can't be a specialist. If you're a software writer or you're a hardware designer of a computer, you've got to understand the rest of the satellite and how it works, even, especially these little tiny satellites. You've got to understand the thermal. You've got to understand the structural. You've got to understand communication. You've got to understand all of these disciplines. So you become multidisciplinary. So you build up a cadre of people who don't think in one little narrow channel. And these people have been proliferating. These people have been graduating. They've been going out. A lot of them don't work in satellites, but some of them do. And so people have to be. And as time goes on through the 2000s, we've continued to build and continue to build in new generations of hardware. And now with cell phones, the cell phone world has done a lot for satellites because the processors that are not your cell phones design ultra low power, ultra high capability with really good software development kits, really good software development environment, stuff we didn't have. When we were building our satellite in the early 1990s, I was still using an 8186 processor and banging it out in the silver uh, for a small satellite. And so now with this sophisticated capability, you start to build, just like you do in a computer industry, you build libraries. And you have parts, and these parts are less expensive because they're really small. <coughs> and you have these accelerometers that comes from the, uh, the automobile industry that are used for airbags, that they make millions of them now, but they're also really good for guidance and navigation control. They're also good for IMUs. And then you have these communications chips, integrated systems where you have RF. You used to, you couldn't get RF and baseband on the same chip. Now you have single chip radios, you have software defined radios. So now we've continued to start to drop down the cost. And again, it's just like what happened in the computer industry, as you drive down cost, applications start to proliferate. So now, here we are, we're in 2010, 2011, 2012, we're in this era. There's a whole set of new companies that are building CubeSat. Some of them are just a few blocks away from here. One of them is called Planet Labs. And the guys at Planet Labs have built, and they're up on the space station right now, 28 remote sensing satellites. These satellites are what's called the 3U CubeSat, which is three of the little 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter satellites stacked together. And they put an optical system on it. And so now they have something with an application because what they want to do, they want to drive down the cost of images. Because the satellites that are up there now doing this, the GOIs, the uh, companies like that, these are still hundreds of millions of dollars satellite. Well, Will and uh, Robbie and those guys, they're trying to drive down the cost of these satellites to the sub one million, hundreds of thousands. So what this has started to do is to help proliferate applications. We have Pavel here, and uh, I met Pavel a few months ago. We're working with them. Pavel was working for a company called the Climate Corporation. They were taking the Landsat data, and their company was sold to Monsanto for a billion dollars. So these applications are starting to proliferate, and so what's happening, the venture capital people are getting interested. And, and I'm going to take a side step here for a minute to Elon Musk. Everybody, just about everybody here knows who Elon Musk is. PayPal, SpaceX. Well, Elon put his own money where his mouth was. But when you do that, money brings money. And so Elon, working with Steve Jurgensen at Draper Fisher Jurgensen, a venture capital firm that a lot of you guys probably know who, who they are, <clears throat> uh, Steve put some money into SpaceX and brought other money from Silicon Valley in. And then Elon, you know, we call Elon the Tony Stark of our era, uh, and doing Tesla and Solar City and all of this. But SpaceX, they're trying to take you know, all of the lessons because the military industrial complex in this country is so bloated and inefficient because their goal is not to build the, in all these defense contractors. How they make their money, how, how we make the money in the computer industry is we sell as much as we can for as high a price as we can and as much profit as we can. In the government world, in the military industrial complex, how they make money is that you have uh, the cost of the system and they give you the overhead and then the government gives you a fee. How do you make more money? You pile on more cost because your profit, which is your fee and your overhead, which is kind of your internal profit, is based on how much your system costs. 
So there's zero incentive. And what's happened in our military industrial complex in this, country, in this country, it's getting more and more inefficient as time goes on. <coughs> well, Elon comes in and takes advantage of this inefficiency and starts building, because he has the goal, the same goal that we had in the computer industry. Another part of my background, <coughs> I was at a company called Vector Graphic Incorporated. We were one of the early microcomputers. And we were there, and we were doing three and five and 10 million a month in revenue, but when IBM came in with a mass computer, they dropped the prices, and you know, we've been on this positive <laughs> reinforcing spiral ever since then of increasing capabilities and lower prices. Elon is trying to bring that, just like Will and those guys and myself, trying to bring these lower prices and all to space. So Elon's doing this, we're doing this, but we're also, and we can't leave the government out of this, how Elon and a lot of these people are doing is public-private partnerships. The International Space Station, which is built by the government, costs $100 billion, but it's up there, and the government wants people to use it, and they pay Elon to bring payloads up. Well, now they're, they've got this $100 billion edifice up there, and they need payloads, they need people to come up. And so that's what Will's doing, that's what Elon's doing, is that they're surfboarding on this, but they're doing it to lower their cost. And this right here, this is a little CubeSat. What they're doing here, they have a, a satellite that they launch CubeSats, mini CubeSats out of, and then they have what's called pocket cubes, which are even smaller. It's less than a kilo. And there's a, another group that's doing what's called um, chip sets. It's basically a little circuit board that's like 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters <coughs> with a little antenna on it and a little solar cell on it that, that's like grams. And they're throwing hundreds of these out. So what they're trying to do is to continue to proliferate, to try to build on the concept that we pioneered in the computer industry of lower cost, more applications, and, and better systems. We're going to get to the point, and we are getting there, and we're getting close to this now, is to where we can start to think outward. We do have today a $300 billion a year geosynchronous communication satellite market, but it's very capital and intensive. If we're going to do the economic development of the solar system, we're going to start somewhere. Like so many people, and this goes back to Ben Miracle, as you read about this, they're going to do stuff on the moon now, or Mars One. They're going to put a colony on the moon. You can't raise the money for that. You're not going to do that right now. It's a valiant effort. It will help push the ball down the road a little bit more. But, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and there's a lot of people have been doing this. You're not going to raise the money, crowdfunding, to build a colony on Mars. It's just not going to happen, no matter how laudable the idea is, no matter how many people think it's a good idea. But the CubeSats, these guys are raising five and 10 and 20 million dollars. GFJ, Jennifer Fisher Jurgensen, put money into Planet Labs. There's another group called Daria that's right across from me. They just raised 20 million dollars. And you guys know, you're Silicon Valley people, you understand the culture of venture <coughs> capital and how much risk the venture capital community is wanting to do. You can raise 10 million dollars. You can raise $20 million. You're not going to raise a billion. You're not going to raise $5 billion when you just have an idea and a PowerPoint presentation. So, and, and I keep jumping around because I want to keep re-emphasizing the point. So, in going outward from low Earth orbit to geo-orbit, geo-orbit typically has been these really big satellites. They make a lot of money. Uh, a $300 million satellite will make about $1.5 to $2 billion over its 15-year lifetime. But just think, if you could take and put the same capability in a 200 kilo satellite or a 1,000 kilo satellite and start bringing that down. But in, in, in the real estate world, everything is location, location, location. That's how you make your money. In space, it's how much power do you have and how much aperture, how big is your antenna? <laughs> That governs, or your optical system, that governs how you make your money. So what NASA did, and this is, this is one of my ideas, is looking forward to, to taking advantage of higher technology propulsion systems. This is a solar electric propulsion system. 
So one of the things we do is that we're working with NASA to take CubeSats to different orbits. <clears throat> because again, we're leveraging. We're leveraging on what the CubeSats are doing, and we're, we're taking advantage of their hardware. Instead of us, and aerospace companies do this every day of the week, if it's Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, these guys, if they design a new satellite, they'll start it from a clean sheet or from what they've already done, their processors, their communications and all, and they work from there. They would never think of going out and buying a computer uh, like what they're talking about, like what they've done with phone sats, and using a phone sat CPU, the software development kits. Can you imagine having to re -de redevelop your software development uh, kit for your own processor for a space mission? Can you, you guys know how much that kind of stuff costs? But if you can use the off the shelf stuff, you can do it. I actually flew. In 1992, I flew on a space shuttle. I flew the first Macintosh that ever flew in space. I flew it on the space <laughs> shuttle as an experiment controller. NASA told me it wouldn't work. The hard drive. You know, hard drives would work in space. Why? It can't survive launch. Well, yeah, here's the spec. It's better than your spec for launch. And so we flew this, but they still didn't want to listen. It's, it's still easier to be safe. And so we flew that in the, the mid-1990s. They flew pinions with d dynamic rail. Nobody thought that would work. And they flew to the moon for Clementine. But the aerospace world is so high-bound, cultural. It's a cultural issue. And you guys understand corporate culture. You guys here at Mozilla work very hard to have a good corporate culture. But if you look at the corporate culture in the aerospace world, it's, it's just like, you know, you walk in, here's your straitjacket, put on your straitjacket, go in there and go work. <clears throat> so, in, in looking at this and looking forward, we're at this point now where there's a lot of cool stuff starting to happen. Um, this is a path not taken so far. If, if aperture is what you need in space, how do you do it without it costing so much? This actually, right here, is uh, from a, some work we did with NASA in 2005 on building large space structures. And this is with the Large Space Structures Group. And to give NASA kudos, there's some wonderful people at NASA. I work with the guys at NASA Langley. They've been designing really radical systems for 30 years. They never let them get past the paper stage, ever. Even when on the space station, they were going to have originally an unorbit assembled truss on the space station. The astronauts were going to go out. The administrator of NASA said, no, 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 that's going to endanger the astronauts' lives, we can't do that, we'll integrate everything on the ground. Well, that makes the aerospace companies a lot more money. Uh, but the guys in orbit, it turns out it's a lot easier to do. And then one of the previous pictures I showed there, the ACE access mission on the shuttle, right there, they built a 30-meter truss in 30 minutes. So it was possible, but they just didn't want to do it. It was, it was easier and, and safer to do it this other way. So we looked at this, and we worked with NASA, and we, we've even done some interesting work. This is the Robonauts. We took the, this is the same truss that they were going to use originally to build the space station truss in orbit, and we had the Robonauts do it down at NASA JSC in 2005. We even proved it back then that you could do that. And then right here, the NASA guys, and this, this right here is from the early 1990s. They built a telescope. Right now, NASA's building a telescope called the James Webb Telescope. Nine billion dollars. Costs more than an aircraft carrier task force for a telescope that weighs 5,000 pounds. Nine billion dollars. We showed, and the guys at NASA Langley showed this in the, uh, let's see, where's that, right here, in the early 90s, that they could build a 14 meter, the James Webb Telescope is six meters. Or six, it's either six or six and a half. These guys showed in the early 1990s that they could build a 14 meter optically diffraction limited telescope. Uh, and they showed it in the tank using the same processes that they used to build the truss that went up on the shuttles, the same group of people. They built a 14 meter antenna, uh, telescope in about four hours. A 14 meter diameter telescope can put pixels on Earth like planets out to about 500 light years. You want to see if there's other Earths out there? This is it. But they don't do it because it's easier. It, it's, 
build it on the ground. It's safer. We can prove it. It's a cultural issue. But those of us in the commercial industry who don't have those constraints, we want to move forward. Well, we have the space station again and again. <coughs> again, I'm a very practical person. I don't want miracles. I don't want to be like the guy at the blackboard saying no miracle occurs. I want to be, have a very practicemic approach, approach that makes money on the way. <laughs> because as you know, if a co corporation can't make money, you can't make progress. How little progress would have had over the past 25 years if they hadn't been able to monetize Mosaic. If they hadn't been able to take and, and with uh, computers and windows and everything else that came, as much as we don't like windows, then the millions and millions and making money in these corporations that went IPO because as they say in the movie, the right stuff, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. And what we, we all want Buck Rogers because to us, space is not only cool, it's the future of mankind. So we have the space station up there now, and we're building these applications. We look right here at building a large solar electric space tug. This space tug is reusable. This space tug uh, is, we're building a small version of this right now that's only five kilowatts. This one right here is about 30 kilowatts. This big is bigger than the largest geosynchronous communication satellites. Now, how many of us want more communications? To be able to have, it's called ubiquitous internet. I wrote one of the very first papers in 1989 when I was a student and won a IEEE award for is called putting the 802 uh, standard in orbit, which is the internet for a, uh, for a satellite constellation. And right now you have Google with O3B. O3B will be active here in a few months. You have HughesNet, you have uh, iDirect, you have these internet over satellites. They're still too expensive. They're still not competitive. They're still not handheld. But think about if you had 60 kilowatts of power in geo orbit in a big antenna. It's just physics. A link margin is a link margin. You don't think about this when you play with your phone, but somebody figured out the link margin, which is the ability to send data uh, with very little, uh, with very few errors from that cell tower to your phone. Well, over the years, those cell towers used to be a lot bigger. They used to have a lot more powerful transmitter, and what they did over time uh, is that these cells are smaller, your phones, your phones have the crappiest antennas in the world. Most of us know that. <clears throat> but, they, but the link margins are there, and we're going with 3G data and 4G data because they're making the, the smaller cells more powerful, more frequency diversity, more bandwidth. So, but we know we have limitations in these bandwidths. There's so many applications here on Earth. What if we had a geosynchronous satellite with the server, and this is what we were doing. I actually signed the first space act agreement with NASA to put a Mac cube on the space station as an internet server. What if you had a server in space? Because one of the problems with HughesNet and iDirect and these internet over satellite is that you're here at your computer, you hit the key to go to a website, the signal goes 22,000 miles up, it goes 22,000 miles back down to the network operations center. It goes out to the internet. It comes back. It goes up to the satellite and back. That's a huge waste of bandwidth. What if you had a petabyte class server sitting in geo -order? You would immediately cut 60% of the bandwidth needed. Immediately. And so what we looked at doing, what we were working with NASA on, was to put a server that would cache internet. Uh, because most of us, we frequently visit sports, news, porn, whatever, the, the major applications, and let's face it, porn is one of the major applications in the world, and major bandwidth hogs in the whole world that people do. So there's all these different applications that people do every day, you cache them. And if you have these big systems, so now you're taking and proliferating the internet, you're extending the reach of the internet, so now, I've got systems that are 22,000 miles up. 
And this right here, this is the this is like the telescope, the 14 meter telescope. But this right here, this is a large solar electric tug, and this actually shows stuff going to the moon. But it can carry a, a satellite to geo orbit, a large satellite. That's a 500 kilowatt system. What if you had 500 kilowatts of power in geo orbit? You could go, and, and right now, Direct TV works. And Direct TV works because they made the satellites bigger. You have satellites with up to 20, 21, 22 kilowatts of power, and they use what's called the KA band. KA band is uh, up in the 10, 20 to 30 gigahertz band, so you have a lot more bandwidth. In order to make the link margins work, because at these higher frequencies you have a lot more atmospheric absorption, they have a lot more power and bigger antennas so that they can punch through the atmosphere and make the link margins work. There are much higher frequencies. There's Q band in the 40 and 50 gigahertz range. There's the V band up above that. But there's a lot of atmospheric absorption from oxygen. Well, if I had a 500 kilowatt transmitter, I wouldn't care. And a big antenna, I could make those link margins and I can make very wide bandwidth. Now there has been recent uh, testing, and NASA just did this, and Pete Warden, who's down here, he's the center director at NASA Ames, he's always been a maverick. He was in the military and the Air Force and he was a maverick. They never let him get past the one star because of that. But he's one of the guys that's a mentor of Robbie and these guys at Planet Labs and a lot of these CubeSat companies to, to do innovative things. But Pete, in the LADEE mission that's in orbit around the moon right now, has a laser transmitter or transceiver. It's 20 megabits per second up to the moon, 622 megabits a second laser column back to the Earth from the moon. We did stuff like we sent all of our names and pictures and stuff like that to the moon and they laced it back. So, you know, I've at least had my uh, photons sent to the moon and back now, so I'm very happy about that. But think about that as a, as a means to upload the cache to these big geo satellites. So that's how you start to get to geo and then you build bigger platforms and bigger platforms because one of the problems, geo orbit, is real estate. It's expensive real estate. To buy a slot in geo orbit is hundreds of millions of dollars just to buy the slot. But what if we could take and build big ends? Well, what some of these satellite companies do, they put five or six or seven satellites in there just to track the problem. But if you had these big platforms that you could then service, even possibly send people up. So now we're at 22,000 miles up with people and we've done it properly. Okay, so that's the key. We've got to be able to do this and make a buck and turn the money over and to be able to do more things. It's kind of like, and, and I've done a little research, I didn't know that you have the Mozilla Foundation, it's actually your parent, and then you have your Mozilla Corporation. I think that's wonderful. And what you guys do here, you know, your, your mission and your goal is not to go out there and cash out and sell out and, you know, go live in Bali for six months. Well, maybe you like to live in Bali, but, you know, you still, you, there's a mission here. You believe, just like what we believed in the early 1980s, we had t-shirts that wrote the graphic that said computers for the betterment of society. We knew what we were doing then. You guys here at Mozilla know what you're doing now. I don't know how many of you, how many Mozilla folks are here? So we just, have, we just have a couple of things. You know what you're doing. Yeah, but the, the Mozilla culture is like that. And so, but if you want to do it, and this is what Elon's doing. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Elon doesn't have the money. He sold out, the, you know, he cashed out PayPal, but he doesn't have the money to go to Mars. But what he is doing is building a profitable business that gets him one step, one step, one step. Eventually, Elon will get to Mars. And that's how we do it, is that we begin in G my own idea is we get in geo orbit, we get up to geo orbit, and then we start, we build a construction facility. And this construction facility can be in lower orbit. Because now we have the money, you know, and we're paying Elon for rides, and we're making deals, and we get up there, and we're doing this profitably, and we build a construction center. And then we do things like build these satellites. See, if you look over there, these are all satellite designs that I've done moving forward uh, to show the concepts and how the concepts work. The concepts are all same. It's just we've got to get there, and you're not going to get there immediately. I mean, that may be a $500 million or $750 million satellite. 
But if you're starting out and you're carrying CubeSats and you're doing your leveraging, so now we're at 22,000 miles up. But you don't think about this, geo orbit, which is 22,700 miles up, is closer to the surface of the moon in energy terms than low Earth orbit. So the, in, in terms of energy, and when you're in space, you think in terms of energy, not distance. It's all, it's all about energy, orbital energy, kinetic energy, uh, potential energy, Hamiltonians, for those of you who've taken uh, physics courses. And so the surface of the moon is closer to geo orbit than low Earth orbit is, the space station, even. And I don't even count the, count the seven kilometers a second that it takes just to get from the Earth to space. The Earth, we, I mean, we live in a gravity well, and I really mean that, because it takes so much energy. It takes over nine kilometers a second of energy to get from the Earth's surface out, of, out to just what's called C3 of zero, which is the very edge of Earth's gravitational attraction. So in terms of energy, so now I'm a geo. Well, it's not that hard to get from geo orbit to the moon. Well, you get to the moon, well, there's some more, there's some more of the satellite designs. You get to the moon, what are you going to do on the moon? Well, it's an interesting study if you think about it. Our civilization, if we were going to, if we were going to move, let's just take the miracle occurs approach for a moment. If we were, if we found a planet around Alpha Centauri, and we were going to move there, we would, how would we design that civilization? We wouldn't do like how civilization has developed on the Earth, start out you know, in caves or start out as farmers and no technology, no nothing. We would actually go there with a the technological civilization. We would go and say, how much energy do we need? How much resources do we need? Well, if you think about that, it works on the moon as well. The moon in microcosm is like the Earth in macrocosm. It takes so much energy to run our civilization. And one thing that we have to think of, and this is one of the driving reasons, one of the things that we want to go to the moon for, is we're going to have 9 billion people living on the Earth in the year 2050. Those 9 billion people all deserve to have the same level of prosperity that we have here in San Francisco, or we have here in the United States, or we have in the Western world, or as China's doing. China, one, if you read their political writings, China is working and pushing as hard as they can to grow as fast as they can because they've been reading the same literature that we have that the Earth doesn't have enough resources for everybody. So they want to get theirs. And if you look, we're in a global competition for resources. But there's resources. The Earth's resources is just a small fraction of the resources available to mankind in the solar system. And the first place where those resources are is on the moon. And it's another whole long talk to, to really go into gross detail. But again, if you're going to go to the moon, you start out with energy. And on the moon, you have these really cool places at the poles. Because the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees. So you have uh, at the North Pole, it's dark six months and light six months. And the same thing with the South Pole. Well, on the moon, the moon is only tilted three degrees to what's called the planet of the ecliptic, to the, to the relative to the sun. And so there are areas at the north and south pole of the moon that are permanently lit, or near permanently lit, which means you can go there with solar power. You don't have to have nuclear reactors to use to start. And this is one of our designs that we used in my book, and a little plug for my book. I wrote a book about all of this in 2004, and I brought it to you tonight, but it's also available on Amazon.com, and I will have it on Kindle soon, I promise. Um, to start out at the moon, to begin to look for resources. And we have the Apollo program. History, it's my opinion, that history will show, going back in time, that the greatest output of the Apollo program, the reason Kennedy did this on top of the football game analogy, is it was a substitute for war. Those of us who are, and I'm not really old enough to remember, but those we're old enough to remember the United States and Russia came within a very close hair of going to any full-scale nuclear war in the early 1960s. 
President Kennedy made some very bad miscalculations, and so did the Russians, and we ended up almost going to nuclear war. Well, President Kennedy, being a smart man, is going, this, this is stupid. We don't want to do this, but we want to show our superiority to the Russians. And this, again, is why we put the money. If you look at, like, the United States in World War II, we spent the equivalent of several trillion dollars over a four-year period to win World War II. Massive increases in technology. Massive, just massive increases in, in the pace of progress over that four-year period. Well, Kennedy, when doing the moon missions, was a substitute for war. The Apollo missions only cost, in today's money, about $35 billion. That's very cheap compared to war. And, and it was a very wise thing to do, even though it broke the budget and all the other things of the 1960s. So, but history will show the most valuable output of the Apollo program were those 382 kilograms of rocks that we brought back. Because we found out in those rocks, there's oxygen, there's metals, there's meteorites that have hit that are in those rocks. And we now know from our remote sensing stuff that we've done since then, there's water on the moon. There's billions of tons of water at the North Pole and at the South Pole. In space, uh, space guys like to think of water as propellant, it's energy. If we can harvest that water, we can begin to build an energy infrastructure between the Earth and the Moon. And so we start to build an energy infrastructure. There's all the metals there. We have had this amazing thing that has happened in the past five years. 3D printing. How many people like 3D printing? 3D printing. I hate 3D printing. Yeah. <laughs> 3D printing is, is bringing a fundamental transformation for us as space architects and how space is done. We can now go up and use metals on the moon or concrete on the moon and things like this to build structures. We don't have to do what we have done for the past 40 years is to take everything from the Earth where we're going. The Saturn V, the biggest launch vehicle in the world, it weighed six and a half million pounds sitting on, it was six and a half million pounds sitting on the launch pad. It delivered 33,000 pounds to the lunar surface. That's because we were carrying everything. But just like the Roman military used to do, and most militaries did until the modern era, you live off the land. If we can go to the moon and start living off the land, we can build buildings on the moon. If you build buildings on the moon and you put oxygen in there, you can start to grow crops. You can start to build things. You, people can actually live there. And if you, if you look at advanced technology, a lot of advanced technologies today in aerospace, uh, in many, many manufacturing areas, vacuum. People, uh, advanced alloys, it's all done in a vacuum. And there's actually a technique, uh, it's the cryostat. Very, very um, precise control of temperatures in a vacuum. That was invented by a guy by the name of Neil Ruzik, while he was writing a book in 1965 called The Case for Going to the Moon. That's where the cryostat came from. Because you can manufacture on the moon. If you can manufacture on the moon, you can build a spacecraft on the moon. And a spacecraft on the moon that you launch in the lunar orbit, it's only like from the Earth just to low Earth orbit, it's seven and a half kilometers a second of what we call delta V. From the moon surface to lunar orbit, it's only a kilometer and a half a second, or 1.6 kilometers a second of delta V. So much, much, much smaller gravity wave. So now I can build single stage to orbit because, again, I don't need, uh, that because there's no atmosphere, I don't need to build a bullet to get me through the atmosphere efficiently. I can build something that looks weird, uh, but carries cargo to, to space. And because we're already out at the moon, so now, in, in terms of gravity well, we're, we're nine and a half, we're almost to the edge of the gravity well. Then we can go out to the asteroid belts, we can go to Mars. Well, in the asteroid belt, and this is something, uh, how many of uh, uh, everyone read about the Chebulinsk bolide that blew up over Russia back in February? How many saw that on the internet? Really, really wild, it, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage and put over 200 people in the hospital. And in 1908, in Russia, a lot of you know about the Tuskunga blast. 
that was hurt 3,000 miles away and destroyed several hundred square miles. But very, very few, few people know that in July of 1972, there was an asteroid that came into the Earth's atmosphere low enough that people with video cameras in Colorado filmed it coming through the atmosphere, came within 40 miles of the surface. If it had hit, it would have made a crater a mile in diameter, as big as the one in Arizona at Meteor Crater. We live in a dangerous solar system. We also want to, but all of these objects that have danger are also resources. The smallest near Earth asteroid that we know about that's made of metal is worth 50 trillion dollars in platinum group metals and nickel and cobalt. We have so much resources. The reason that we're, one of the reasons we're resource limited on the Earth, over 70% of the Earth is water, and so <clears throat> resources are at the bottom of the ocean. Of the uh, land area that's left, there's only a few percent that's really, really, that we can get into. And then mining is one of the most polluting things that we do as a species. Wouldn't it be more fun or would it be environmentally more uh, conscious to mine, pre especially precious metals that are in very low concentrations on the Earth, we can mine them not only on the asteroids, but on the asteroids, and this is the thesis in my book, asteroids that have hit the moon. So we have these opportunities and we have this, if we, if we, it's, it's kind of a culture here. If we have an outward looking culture, I, I wrote a chapter in a book several years ago. I was asked by the Defense Department to contribute to a book on what's called space power theory. There's different, they're, they're called power theories. There's, there was a German general by, uh, by the name of, a writer by the name of Clausewitz, I don't know if he was a colonel, Clausewitz in Germany that talked about land power theory. The theory of how armies and how armies and nations create and generate power. It's one of the things that Europeans who love to fight in wars with each other all these hundreds of years that we got away from over here, at least for a little while, uh, the, uh, melding military and national power. There was a guy by the name of Martin that did this for sea power. And this is what Teddy Roosevelt read about. It made, started making the big American fleet in the early part of the century. And then Billy Mitchell talked about air power theory. Well, we were commissioned by the Pentagon to write a book on space power theory. And the wealth of any nation is tied to its ability, uh, its people, and the physical resources it has available. The reason the United States is what it is, it, it, it's not just our physical resources, it's the resource of our people. It's our intellectual capital. It's who we are. It's our freedom and how we've been able to enable people to do things in this country. But at the same time, if you're looking at space, there were some things, there were decisions made in the 1960s that limited us. There was a guy by the name of McNamara who came up with the idea, he's the one who came up with the idea of mutually assured destruction. In the 1950s, President Eisenhower commissioned a top secret study called the Horizon Project to put a base on the moon. That was a military base, but Von Braun, who did the report, also talked about the commercial and the development and the exploration of the moon. But what McNamara did, and this influences our policy today, is that anything in space that's not communications or remote sensing is bad. And this is why the Air Force that had their own space station they were going to launch, they killed it. That's one of the reasons that uh, the U.S. military just isn't involved in space except for two things, communications and remote sensing. Now, it's good that we never put nuclear weapons in space. It's really, really good that we never did something stupid like that. But at the same time, when we wrote our, our, our book on space power theory, and I guess I've like got about 10 minutes left, you got all the time you want. All right, so no, I'm not going to keep everybody too late. I want uh, about another 10 minutes and we can have some fun and I'll open it up for questions. Um, we looked at the McNamara Doctrine and all these different doctrines that the United States had, and I came up with a, a word that's called geocentric. We look at things in a geocentric perspective. 
uh, the people in political power in Washington. Space and how they look at it, they don't look at space looking outward. They only look at space looking back. That's what communications and remote sensing is. That's the only good thing that space is good for. Communications and remote sensing because anything else is destabilizing. That was their idea in the 60s, and that still governs U.S. policy today. And so what we did is we started looking at this and said, how do we, in the same uh, construct of Klaus with Martin, and Mitchell, look at space power outward? Because if our civilization, not just the United States, we, we wrote this in the generic, it wasn't just about the U.S., it was about any country. If you have access to resources, like we think we're a very rich country, and compared to, our, our, to Rome, compared to any ancient culture, we are fabulously rich. But we're very poor. We have billions of people around the world that get by on very, very, very little. If we had access to the resources of the solar system, the moon, the asteroids, Mars, a whole civilization, having access to that, the level of wealth of our planetary civilization, what's going to be 9 billion people in 2050, is going to be much higher. Uh, there was a report done by the Indian government a couple of years ago that they were projecting gross national product of China, India, uh, Europe, and the United States. The gross national product or the GNP of China was going to be something like $100 trillion by 2050. And so what this Indian government in China and India was going to be, they were going to be somewhere around a, a quarter to a third of what China was, the U.S. was going to be uh, over a hundred trillion. So what they're looking at, and, and their study was how does India obtain the resources it needs to become a 27 trillion dollar GNP country? Because if you don't have resources, you're not going to. It doesn't matter how smart you people. And so that was what they're looking at. But if we have access to the resources of the solar system, and this was our space power theory, how does that change the posture? Because one of the biggest problems we face, because today we are almost on a precedence, our civilization now. How many of you have heard of Singularity University and the Singularity Moment? Okay, everybody, most everybody here has heard about that. And that's, some people call that the Pollyanna version <laughs> of the future. And, and there's very many positive things to, to lend itself to that idea. But we also, how many people saw, have seen the movie Elysium? To where you have a, a rich few people living on a space station while everybody else here on Earth lives in an environmentally wrecked Earth. And then there's the even worse scenario and because of either global warming or lack of resources, if you take a look at all the wars we fought in the past couple of hundred years, most of them have been linked to resources. The Japanese war aim in World War II was to secure oil, secure rubber, and secure metal supplies in Southeast Asia. That was their war aim. The German war aim, besides Liebenstrom, the living area for the people, was to secure the oil in Romania, secure the resources of Russia for the greater German people. It was about resources. And the, so the worst scenario is that between the big blocks, India, China, Europe, us, we get into a scramble over the resources of this one limited planet, chaos is going to ensue. So this is the spectrum that we look at. So this is part of my own thesis here in, in a lot of the people that we worked with in the space power theory is if we look out forward in the resources of the solar system which are several thousand times greater than we have there's one asteroid called 216 Psyche or 16 Psyche this asteroid is 250 kilometers across a solid chunk of metal you cannot estimate how much that is valuable, the value of platinum group metals and all these valuable metals that we have and, and we need in our civilization. So that's what we are looking at in the economic development of the solar system and the purpose. Because everything, is, you have to have a philosophy. And at the beginning of World War II, there was a book written called The Last Best Hope of Earth. And under that, 
uh, was written by Dabble, and I'm sure he was the head of Reader's Digest. He, uh, he was the CEO of Reader's Digest, and he wrote at that time, when we only had 2.1 billion people on Earth, that we were an integrated global economic society. At nine billion, and we all know that we live in a global society today. But moving forward to become a wealthy society, to be able to reach that singularity moment, we need more resources. So what I've talked about here tonight, I, I, I've given you now the far end. But to get there, without having to depend on the government, because it's unfortunate that our government is populated with liars. Liars are not trained the same way we engineers and scientists are. You know, engineers and scientists make just as uh, many stupid mistakes in our own way, but our founding fathers in this company were all scientists, and, not all, but mostly scientists and engineers. Ben Franklin, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was best friends with all the people in England that created the Industrial Revolution. They understood this. The last four premiers of China have all been in, uh, PhD engineers. They understand this. Right now, we have the approach. There are ways of doing this with or without the government bootstrapping our way, just in the same way that we originally bootstrapped the mic what we called in the early 1980s the microcomputer revolution, what was also called in the 1990s the internet revolution. Today we're seeing the 3D printing, robotics, these other revolutions that are just now getting started. So we have an amazing opportunity here. And, and we have a way to do it in a way that creates peace, in a way that brings prosperity, in a way that does this, not just for Americans, not just for Europeans, not just for Chinese, but everybody in the world. So that's what I'm working toward. Questions? Well, that's the kind of speaker from the Australia Club. Thank you, everybody. I, I just want to really enjoy it. So why don't we take a little bit, uh, little bit of time and open up for questions? I'm sure that there's plenty, so we'll just go uh, this way. Sam? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, great discussion. Great big picture overview. Talk about the resources. But what about settlement? What about living on the moon? Instead of just going to the moon, mining resources to build more rockets, how about we actually talking about infrastructure? Not only at on the moon, but the Lagrange points, and talking about people, families, growing, uh, cats. cats, dogs, whatever, <laughs> when you figure out how to create zero gravity infrastructure, besides just simply mining resources, we need to talk about even bigger picture beyond that. You and I, everyone here, have the opportunity to live, work, and play in space. Well, I still hope that Sport and Eddie, for those of you, uh, those who know me, those are our pity pies, our kitty cats, I still hope they'll be able to retire on the moon. Uh, I do think that all of these locations will have people. Uh, I think that, uh, and there was a horrible science fiction, the, re the remake of uh, The Time Machine, where retirees were living on the moon because it was easier on their bones. But then they blew up the moon. Right. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah. But there, anywhere that we take and I'm not just a robotics fan. We don't want to send all our robots and let them do all the work and we sit here on our ass on the earth. We are going to live up there. And I think uh, with uh, being able to build structures, being able to have oxygen, there, there is no limit to the places that humans can live and have fun doing. So does today Sierra Nevada Corporation announced that Green Chaser is scheduled for its first orbital flight on the 1st of November 2016? Is this Kennedy-like? Is this another way of us saying, hey, look, America's the first one to send people back into orbit? Or is there actually some commercial potential here? Well, there's, there's definitely commercial potential. Those of us who talk about this all the time is uh, uh, Sierra Nevada is a company out of Colorado. They have this little winged vehicle uh, that they want to send up to the space station. I think it's a fabulous idea, and I think it is a strong competitor to SpaceX, and I'm not going to go into details, but I think financially they have a really good chance. Uh, companies like Sierra Nevada and SpaceX don't really talk to each other, but at some point in the future, alliances will be made and it will incrementally bring down the cost. Because again, 
we're not going to have this miracle occurs where tomorrow we're going to be able to launch a pound in orbit for $20. But maybe in 30 years, we'll get there. And this is another step in that direction. How big of an issue is space junk as we start sending more and more stuff up? Is that it, it is a big issue, but it is a tractable issue. Um, I keep talking about it, and I talk about it when I talk in detail. The first place that I personally want to mine is not really the moon. It's all there's a half a million pounds of defunct satellites above geo orbit, and I want to go up there and grab those and reprocess them. Uh, the problem in low Earth orbit is that the if you look at the physics. It's the velocity times the cosine of the angle, and it's extremely expensive to do this in lower orbit, but there's ways of mitigating that degree. And I've seen in papers written that if we take 10% of the really big debris out, which we can do with an electrodynamic tether, that will take care of 50% of the problem. Uh, and right now they design the orbits of these CubeSats. There's actually an FCC uh, guidance it's getting stronger every day that these satellites have to be deorbited where they don't have a lifetime more than 25 years. You know, my satellite has a 76 year orbit, which is still up there, so I can go get it and put it on my desk one day. Yes, sir. Quick question. Uh, do you think there's going to come a point fairly soon where the capacity of like, the spaceports like Cape Canaveral <coughs> to launch, where, the, where <coughs> orbital like, space planes? orbital space planes can take off on a runway will be the preferred option simply because they run out of launch pads to launch standard rockets. It's preferred, but it's hard. You're, you're not going to, my own personal opinion, and, and, what, and this is why uh, Paul Allen is funding a group uh, working with orbital sciences to, la uh, to launch with strato launch. Uh, Strato launch has a chance if you marry that with the Sierra Nevada or something like that. That's another incremental step, and I think eventually, I, you know, I don't think it's going to be the uh, the capacity. I think the stupid paperwork of having to deal with going down the KSC uh, is is what's going to drive these. It's not going to be intrinsic fiscal limitations on one side. Um, this is actually two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, completely unrelated. Um, first one is, do you see that there is any detrimental effects of actually doing development on the moon um, in terms of detrimental effects onto Earth? Uh, for example, maybe uh, the moon is orbited somehow being affected and then the No, and, 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 uh, and hold that knowledge and uh, ask your second question. The moon, if you take a look at the moon, see all those big holes? The moon's been hit by real much, much bigger stuff than we ever could do, uh, and it's still there, and its orbit hadn't changed. Uh, so the, the answer basically is no. Okay. Um, and the same question is, um, you mentioned that you know we have this resource race here on Earth. Um, and if we go out into space and you know um, start collecting resources from there, they're infinite, so-called infinite, right? Um, do you think there's going to be a point in which we develop not you know, 10, 10 billion people, but you know, 100 billion? A, a point know, where the resources run out. And do you, really, the question is, do we need a culture change? Well, actually, it's weird. Um, when people get wealthy, they have fewer babies. If you take a look at Germany, uh, and, and even the United States, and, and most uh, advanced wealthy countries, Japan, Germany, their populations are falling. Italy, uh, a lot of these countries, wealthy nations, wealthy people have fewer babies. Because one of the big drivers, like my own mother had six children. Only two of us survived. So when you're, when you're poor, and, and it's really a practical, uh, a practical decision, I want to have six babies because maybe two of us want to make it to adulthood. But if I live in San Francisco in 2014, you know, or, or you just look at the demographics and the statistics. Um, in 1972, the United Nations estimated that the global population of the Earth in 2050, based on the trends of 1972, would be 13.5 billion people. The latest, like a couple of years ago, UN 
population uh, projection is 9.1 billion people in 2050, this was, the 1972 was 2050 as well, is that 9.1 billion people, and it's being revised down. It's been revised down almost every time. Uh, it's called the demographic transition, and it's happening in every country that becomes wealthy. So the wealthier we are, we and, and Germany and Japan are already facing this, and we're facing it in a lesser, the, the reason the United States population is still growing is because of immigration. Uh, and so the answer is, if you look at the statistics and the demographics, uh, I think the more people are going to start moving out in space. And that's where population growth may actually end up taking off uh, and the population of Earth being stable. It's my own opinion, but based on a lot of stati good statistics that are out there. Sure. Yeah, Dennis, um, one of the uh, ideas that I've talked a lot about in the 70s was um, solar power, like solar power stations being a driver for large scale economic development of the solar system. And that's actually one of the things that you didn't mention tonight. I'm really curious <laughs> is that a loser idea now or is that still viable? Um, I'm a believer in energy, but. To me, uh, if you take a look at the number of launches, and I worked on NASA Solar Power Satellite Systems Integration Team in 2000. And one of my mentors, Gordon Woodcock, worked on the original 1979 study. I think, and it's my own personal opinion, especially like for the moon, that energy is more valuable to stay there, to use for industrialization, rather than beaming it back, because you're wasting. You're wasting most of it beaming it back. If I have a gift, I, I did, as part of the systems integration team at Marshall, I wrote a paper that promptly got buried after I turned it in, that using the side lobe energy from a solar power satellite, I could make 10 times the money off the solar power satellite by beaming television pictures and internet, rather than the electrical power coming from the satellite. Just using the side lobe energy. So, I, the energy is valuable, but it's valuable where it's at. If we had gigawatts in geo orbit, ooh, we could have a lot of fun in terms of communications, in terms of telescopes, and it's called uh, uh, ubiquitous communications. We could do so much more, but I think it's more about. Uh, I'm not a believer in beaming the power back to the Earth. I'd really have a thorium, a 25 megawatt thorium reactor in my backyard. <laughs> So Last you, question. Okay. So, so you were talking about geosynchronous orbit a lot, but what about other orbits? I mean, if you're really going to populate, you know, orbits, geo is just the one orbit. It has one nice property, but many satellites, you put a lot of satellites in solar synchronous orbit, it can always have some satellite over you, and then you've got a lot more orbits to play with, you've got different altitudes, a lot of games to play. Have you thought about sort of the architecture of that? Yeah, I mean, um, the more the merrier, basically. Uh, but it's interesting, and, and Planet Labs is playing on this. Um, they don't have the money, and I'm just going to use this one example. Planet Labs doesn't have the money to buy their own launch vehicle. They got a really cut rate deal to go to the space station, but that's at a 51.6 degree orbit. And so they're overcoming, because the value of a sun synchronous orbit is passing over the same spot with the same lighting conditions and uh, very. Uh, uh, repetitive, predictable orbits. But if I have hundreds of satellites at 51.6 degrees versus 98, I don't care. I don't really care. And I, I think that is a good philosophical uh, uh, systems innovation that they have. So I think a, a lot of orbits are very valuable, but to, to me, geo-orbit is the gold orbit because of, of what you can do. It, it's up there, but low Earth orbit, because I'm not that good with the space station. And a lot of people like to, engineers love to split hairs. Well, we need a space station at 20 and a half degrees because I can get 6% more payload up there. <laughs> the perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, and so, you know, that's, uh, but I, I do see a lot of different orbits uh, being used. And what we're doing with our first product, with the solar electric propulsion system, we can take you whatever orbit you want to go to. Uh, but 
So the answer is yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Okay, well, I, I'm afraid we'll uh, have to close this exciting Q&A session. Uh, let's thank our great speaker one last time, Dennis. And also, let's thank our host, Mozilla Foundation, for great Thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank